Hey guys, welcome back to Brass and Bourbon. I'm Clint, your host. Our next guest we got here is Tyler Young, Marine, father, strong man, mixed martial arts fighter, longtime friend. Tyler, introduce yourself. How's it going, guys? Well, like Clint said, um, I'm a local professional strongman. I've been involved in strength and combat sports for about the last 15 years. Uh, strongman primarily for the last 10. Um, still, it's been probably eight, nine years since the last time I stepped in the cage, but uh, still train Brazilian Jiu Jitsu as much as I can. Uh, along with that, Clint mentioned I was in the Marine Corps. I was in the Marine Corps Reserve from 2014 to 2020. Uh, but, you know, even further back than that, me and Clint been punching each other in the face as long as I can remember. So yeah, That's true. That's true. Absolutely. Well, before we get too, uh, too deep into this, uh, like we do in our, every episode, uh, our bourbon for the day is going to be just standard Buffalo Trace. Can't go wrong with the classic Buffalo Trace from Buffalo Trace Distillery. Um, Tyler? Cheers. Cheers. Classic. <laughs> so, Tyler, so you said you haven't been in the cage in a while, so mm -hmm. I guess just tell us about a little bit more about yourself, starting what got you into your maybe your combat sport days. And Honestly, I can say without a shadow of a doubt, <clears throat> my age kind of, you know, uh, set me up very well to get into combat sports because around the time that I was, you know, looking for something to replace the void that football was going to leave after I left high school, mm. that was about the time that the Ultimate Fighter started to air with, you know, Stephen Bonner and Forrest Griffin that first uh, season. Yep. But more specifically, the Pride Grand Prix, the 06 Pride Grand Prix yep. with Vanderlei Silva and Mirko Krokop. And yep. I watched them, you know, duke it out and I was like, that that's yep. it right there. Um, so I remember we were still, you know, in football season and I, you know, Googled Gracie Jiu Jitsu, you know, near me and I looked all over the place and then finally found the, the judo club here locally with Fred Barnett. And, you know, from there, I just kind of transitioned into training Jiu Jitsu from there. Absolutely. Yeah. I remember those early days of MMA and that's, mm -hmm. that's back. That's like, we call it the good old days. And I, yeah. I, it, to us, it wasn't that long ago that no. we look about it. We're like, Oh yeah, man, that was it was, like yeah. it was like almost 20 years ago. I mean, and it was just wherever we could get it in at at the time. I yeah. mean, we, we would meet at, you know, under Western Stadium at 5.30 in the morning because it was <laughs> before everybody would be there. And they had those, they, I think they were tumbling mats even now. I think before that they had mats, mats down. But yeah. when we were there, they were tumbling mats. So we just, it was with me, you, and Dave Newton, and we were just round robbing on each other. And we'd go to class all, you know, black <laughs> eye and busted up, noses. Yeah. And uh, we'd have a rug burn all over our faces and knees. There's no telling what they thought we were doing. Oh, uh, I remember. Um, yeah. I don't know if you're, if, do you remember the time that the, the, ja the janitor came in and he was like, what are you guys doing in here? And we were like, I uh, nothing. And he was like, all right, well, I'm going to leave you guys to it. And then he walked back out. And that was the only time we ever got bothered there. I do remember <laughs> that. That was good that, times. That was hilarious. I just, I, I'll never, I'll never forget that. I think it was one of the first times we ever, we ever did that. It was either the first or second time mm -hmm. when we started to spar. Mm -hmm. I caught you with like a, just a hard straight jab. And we were, mm -hmm. we, and we weren't going hard at all, but it was just the right spot. Mm -hmm. And I, I caught him with a good hard jab, and just blood yeah. just started pouring out of his nose. And I, you know, me, I'm not, tr I'm not trying to hurt him. I didn't hurt him, mm -hmm. but I, me, I'm like, oh man, I'm sorry. And and you just see, he's like, no, I'm good. And he's yeah, like, no, he does that. <laughs> it, it does that. Yeah, like, my nose bleeds <laughs> all the time. It has since I was little. So uh, my second MMA fight, actually, I, I won in the first round. It was like two minutes in the first round. I didn't even get hit, but my nose bled. <laughs> <laughs> did not even did not even get hit, but I had a nosebleed. So it's just it's just part of the game. That's so. hilarious. <laughs> so what was your, so you, were you haven't fought so long? What what I mean, would you get back in the cage again, or you think that time's yeah, passed? I think that time's kind of passed. Uh, you know, there was a time a couple years ago that I'd kind of flirted with the idea. I, I remember you talking to me of, about of that. maybe coming back. Um, but honestly, I just I just really enjoy being strong, and I remember what kind of led me away from the cage to begin with, and it was just you know that constant steady grind, you know, it was never mm -hmm. feeling like I, I was ever going to be prepared enough. Cause you know, back then I treated that like a part-time job. I mean, you know, I got 15, 20 hours of training in a week minimum. Minimum, yeah. Um, and you know, when I quit fighting, I was seven and one. So, you know, I was pretty close to making that leap, um, you know, to the professional status, if you will. 
And, um, you know, the amount of work that was going to come with that. And I was just so hungry all the time. You know, I, I would cut from 165, 170 to fight at 155. And I fought as low as 140. That was my only loss was at 145. And I just, you know, I, I looked like I'd been in an internment camp. Like, mm-hmm. I, I, you, I share the picture every now and again, but I just looked terrible. Right. I, you remember know, you being a, sick. I remember you being a, a pretty, pretty small but fit yeah. dude i mean you're always fit but yeah. you're a smaller dude and i remember when you cut down to that that yeah. 140 what you did it as healthy as you could but it, it's at so at such a small weight yeah. you can't it's, a, it's a, so well, such a small weight it's such a hard cut you know you and, and i thought about it like going back with what i know now especially like what water cuts should look like and what proper nutrition could look like you know i did that and i was eating maybe eight or 900 calories a day for like six weeks, you know, mm. to get down there. Like I just, I just starved myself yeah. and I got used to running on that, you know, caloric deficit. But, you know, instead of doing any kind of water load leading into the fight, I just depleted myself. So I started sweating like Tuesday or Wednesday and I just quit drinking by like Thursday and then I weighed in Friday. So I just was completely empty, oh, yeah. you know, and in hindsight, knowing what I know now, you know, you front load on the water and then you just, you know, you just pee it all out. Right. So, you know, it would be nice to go back knowing what I know now as far as, you know, how performance goes because I just, I just, you know, the guy that beat me just took me into deep water and drowned me for lack of a better, I mean, he just held me down and wrestled me and uh, I wasn't used to fighting that long. All of my fights ended typically the first minute, first couple minutes. I'd only gone to the second round one other time and then he took me into three. So, uh, it just, I, I wasn't prepared for that. So, right. Right. Understandable. What's that feeling like? before you step into the cage? Because I know some people that throw up and... Um, I didn't really get a whole lot of that. I mean, obviously, you get a little bit of pre-anxiety jitters. Um, but as far as, you know, throwing up or anything like that, more so, you know, I wasn't nervous because I had done my work. I was prepared. I knew what me was coming to the cage. Right. I didn't really care what they brought because I knew what I was bringing, you know? So... I, you know, I didn't miss workouts. I didn't miss training. I didn't, I I was comfortable in my abilities. More so it was, I'm ready to get this over with at this point. So I I didn't really have a whole lot of that. So. Yeah. I think that goes for pretty much any type of competitive sport. Yeah. Uh, As long as you, you, if you know deep down that you've done your work Mm -hmm. in it, uh, the, the jitters are a lot less. Right. Like you may, I don't think you can ever truly get rid of them all. For sure. Uh, just because you're going to get your, you got yeah. the competitive aspect right. of it, but you, you've got, you, you know, you've done your part. You're going mm-hmm. to perform your best. And obviously, you know, there's, there's jitters involved with, you know, what, what is potentially riding on my performance and, you know, how my preparation is going to carry over, if you will. But, um, you know, for example, when I did, you know, the clash, shows for uh in strongman you know those pro shows you know there was a lot riding on that because the finalists got to go to got to be on espn and i knew that exposure was going to be huge for my business and my gym and my Mm -hmm. community and you know so there was a lot of pressure on me i felt like you know it was probably self-imposed pressure of to really show up um so that was a lot of the jitter that i felt with that it was never a question of my ability it was more so i'm going to show them i'm going to show them who i am you know what i mean right yeah so was so kind of leading into the strongman aspect, was the strongman kind of the replacement for the MMA? For sure, for sure. I'll always have to have a hobby, you know. Right. I could get hit by a bus on the way home and be paralyzed from the neck down, and I'll be in a blinking competition, you know, <laughs> next month. Like, you know, I'll be, I'll do some, or a staring com- I'll do something, you know. I'll always have to have something. I don't know why I just have this innate desire to improve and, you know, compete and put myself out there, but I'll always have something that I do like that. Right, yeah. So tell us about the strongman stuff. Like, that's when, so, when I remember when you came, when I found out that you were doing strongman. Yeah. And of course, there was a probably about a three year gap or four year mm-hmm. gap where I kind of was disconnected yeah. for the most part just because of what I was doing in the military. Right. And I was just, I, I just wasn't around. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm thinking Tyler, mm-hmm. 165 pound, 170 mm-hmm. pound, you know, Tyler. Yeah. That's, that's the guy I'm thinking. And then, you know, they're like, oh yeah, Tyler. Yeah. We know Tyler. I'm like, yeah, man. Like that, that's the guy. If you want to, Hey, if you want to learn jujitsu, you want to, you want to get a good mm-hmm. fight. That's, I mean, I'm just promoting him. They're like, yeah, he's doing strong man now. I'm like, what? Yeah. Huh? And they're like, yeah, he's like, he's like 200 pounds right now. I'm like, <laughs> what? Yeah. Well, um, 
so straw man for me uh, started a lot further back. You know, um, I spent a lot of time with my grandfather growing up. He ended up passing away. Actually, it's been 20 years yesterday. Uh, it was real, you know, uh, the anniversary just happened to be yesterday. Um, but I spent a lot of time with my grandfather, Troyes, who I named my you know, oh, yeah. seven-year-old okay. after. Yep. Yeah. And uh, he used to love watching World... And he wasn't, like I said, he was just, you know, a skinny mailman. You know, he... Uh, but he loved watching World's Strongest Man, and uh, like we'd watch it all the time. And so he's the first one that really even got me started lifting. You know, he would go to Total Fitness, and he had just started going for like physical therapy. But then he would go and lift, and he would take me with him. And okay. uh, you know, I would hear him, you know, brag on me and stuff like that. He's like, "My grandson's gonna be strong, and this, that, and the other. He's got muscles coming out of his butthole, and blah blah." <laughs> like, you know, and he'd always give me the protein shakes and. He's like, you got to eat this, you got to eat more, you got to, you know. So he was the first one that started kind of spurning that fire. So, that you know, it was a lot of vindication when Clash did, you know, pan out. And I made it, you know, on ESPN of, hey, he was right, I didn't make it. You know, like he right. he was the first one that said, you know, you can do this if you if you decide you want to. So, um, so you know, for a long time I just kind of tabled that because I'd moved on to, you know, football and then MMA and then when I joined the Marine Corps, um, I was looking for a way to be more combat effective because the Marine Corps' model of fitness isn't... It's gotten better. Right. Uh, it's gotten better with their little... Con, I can't remember the, the HIT training and their little Connex boxes that they've got all over. Yeah. Um, but when I joined, it was very archaic. You know, run three miles, do some pull-ups, and you know, do some way. sit-ups. Yeah, stuck in the dark ages. Yeah. Um, old, old school soldiering. But... Um, so I was looking for a way to be more combat effective. And again, I was just reservist, so I had no grand illusions that I was going to be, you know, in the great invasion of Iran or wherever we go next or whatever. But, you know, it was never anything like that. But I at least wanted to put my best foot forward preparation-wise. Right. Right. So uh, CrossFit wasn't my jam. Uh, I thought it was a little too culty um, at the time. <laughs> I think, you know, CrossFit has its has its place, and I'm yeah. a big fan of the model of CrossFit, but it wasn't for me, you know? It, it still is a little too. Yeah. It's, oh, no, it's 100% it's, it. I didn't say that it wasn't. Uh, <laughs> I, I like I like its model, and I think it does a lot of things right, but I think that it, it leaves a lot to be... Um, yeah. Sorry, CrossFitters. Lot, yeah, I'm not. It leaves a lot to be desired. Um, you go out and get it, but... Yeah, um, but... To me, it wasn't it wasn't the best avenue as far as combat effectiveness again for right. me um, because there's no replacement for displacement. Like there's strength is an attribute no matter how many ways you slice it. Right. Um, now, obviously, I didn't expect to get bit by the bug the way I was, so it was right. obviously detrimental later on in my strongman career. Like I didn't I, I I got in with the idea of you know flipping tires and running farmers and running yokes. I didn't expect to get bitten by the, you know, the heavy bug of let's just deadlift heavy and log press heavy and do this really heavy. And even though the name is Strongman, you know, there's a lot of like, a lot of people don't understand the conditioning aspect involved with Strongman. Have, since I've been following your your Strongman mm-hmm. journey, which I probably follow a little bit more than you think I do, yeah. I've, I've been keeping up with it. I have noticed that a lot more than I've ever noticed yeah. it is the conditioning aspect of it. I, and then, you know, of course, I've been watching the Nationals, when, especially when you, you've, been, mm-hmm. you've been on it. I've been like, you know what, there is there is a lot of, yeah. you know, it's not ju- it's not just lifting the heavy weight. For sure. It's the, there's a, a lot of endurance, cardiovascular endurance with the heavy weight. For sure. And weight. that's the biggest thing that you see. Um, again, I didn't know that there were weight classes in Strongman. You know, I stumbled across this Facebook group. You know, again, in like 2014, and then it kind of got me connected with a with a guy who was trying to put a group together here. Um, but I didn't know there were weight classes, but every weight class is almost like a whole different representation of what the sport looks like. Oh, wow. You know, so heavyweight, the big, you know, six foot eight, six foot nine pros, their sport looks different than ours. No matter how, no matter what they say, it's the same sport, but it's different, you know. Right. So, like, oh, as a 105, because that's where my pro card is in, so a 231 guy, um, you know, there's a little bit more of a carryover for being athleticism, but you can be as strong as you want to be, but if you're not fast or if you're not agile or anything like that, then you'll fall off. Inversely, my frame is small enough that I can, you know, cut down to 90 kilos, which is 198, um, because the weight classes are kind of, you know, spread out. Um, You know, I can cut down to 198 and be competitive, but those guys are real fast. Yeah, I I mean, real fast. And I've cut and competed as low as 80 kilos, which is 175. Mm. And obviously my top end strength was way where it needed to be, yeah. like way above where it needed to be. But the speed, you know, doesn't always follow you. The agility, yeah. yeah, as you get smaller. So you know, it's it's kind of been a jockeying for where I want to be and what what I want my imprint to be in the sports strongman. And this one hundred and five. If honestly, if there was 
one of the federations does a hundred kilo class, which is two twenty. That'd probably be about my sweet spot. That, is that that's kind of that's in between? Yeah, yeah. Because most of the guys that compete at two thirty one, um, they cut from two fifty five, two sixty. You know, the guy that won the world's strongest man last year at one hundred five kilos cut from probably two seventy five. Yeah, so yeah. you know you'll see him getting two or three bags of ivy. So I'm competing against the heavyweight, which is not me. I don't really care, right? Because I'll walk in eating a breakfast burrito and I weigh in at two twenty five with my clothes on. You know what I mean? Like, right. Let well, them struggle. They're and... they're, str- they're struggling a little bit more, and you're you're just just naturally. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So so, but I always like competing that way because you know that's what I hated the most about being fighting or about when I was fighting is how hungry I was all the time. Right. I don't want to worry about cutting weight. Like I want to eat well. I want to feel good. You know, there were times, you know, especially leaving the gym when I was prepping for fights, I was like, man, I couldn't beat up a third grader right now. I was like, I'm so hungry. Mm-hmm. I haven't eaten since yesterday. You know, I've just worked out for four hours. Like, this isn't tenable. Like, you this just, isn't. You'll gas out. I just was, I just felt terrible. I just, and I, obviously, you know, this is circa 2010, 2011. A lot of things would be done differently now. Yeah, absolutely. What I, know. Well, I mean, well, our knowledge we increases. Just didn't, we just didn't know. Just didn't know, yeah. I so. mean, I remember, I remember my first fight, um, uh, one of my, he's no longer with us anymore, but my buddy set it up with us, um, uh, set it up for me. And, uh, he's like, Hey, uh, and I, I used to walk around two two thirty five. 235. That was just my walking around with, yeah. you know, and, and you know, when I was younger, I could, I can handle 235. Mm-hmm. And he, he's like, Hey, I need you to be at 205, uh, this weekend. Mm-hmm. It was Tuesday. Yeah. And, and well, I just basically just suffered. Start, suffered. Mm-hmm. It, you know, sauna in a in a in a yeah. in a trash bag and and just yeah. starved myself and went to a caloric deficit and mm-hmm. and and weighed in <clears throat> exactly two oh five and just felt like dog crap. Yeah. And luckily, the guy that I, was, I fought backed out of the fight mm-hmm. and they you just suffered for nothing. <laughs> suffered for nothing. But it was one of it's one of these janky janky you know janky fights. So yeah, they found a replacement for him that was basically just somebody that was out of the crowd almost. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, yeah. it, was, and, it was over It was over quick, let's just say that. And especially, you know, and I'm sure that this research was already available then, but, you know, I wasn't privy to it or didn't know how to access it. But there's a lot of information that's come out recently, especially in combat sports, about, you know, was the blood-brain barrier and, like, the fluid that separates your, your brain from your skull. Mm. And when you deplete... You know your fluids like that to that extreme that it can affect that blood brain blood brain barrier, and you know contribute directly to traumatic brain injury and concussions and stuff like that. So you know I'm really anxious to see what it's going to look like in 15 to 20 years of you know all the people that we came up with, you know cutting you know crazy amounts of weight because they didn't know how to cut weight you know. Um, but it's not just going to be a localized phenomenon. It's going to be everywhere, everywhere because that's about the time that, you know, MMA started kicking off was 2006, 2007. Right. Do you think that you should fight at your walking around weight or do you think that weight cuts are necessary in a way? Um, I think that they could relegate a little bit better. So I wrestled in college and they had, um, I can't remember what the test was called, but they would come in and they would be like, you can't cut below this weight. Uh, it was like the water cut test or something. I can't remember what it was called. Um, but they would measure your body fat percentage and how hydrated you were, and we were supposed to come in hydrated for it. Mm. Um, and they would limit how low you could go. You know, so you look at somebody, uh, Anthony Johnson, Anthony Rumble Johnson comes to mind. You know, he finished his career as a heavyweight, I think, but he fought as a welterweight if memory serves. Like, and then he kept missing, so they bumped him to 185. And then he missed weight at 185, so they bumped him to 205. Like, he fought at, like, all sorts of weight classes. And it just makes me wonder, like, what are you leaving on the table? You know, what, like, if your goal is to be the best you can be, to be the best fighter that you can be, you know, I understand that there's going to be some variability between your performance output of, you know, of where you feel the best. So I feel real strong here at about 225, but I don't, I'm not super agile, you know, but if I go down to 215, my agility starts to come back, but my top end is gone. So there's always going to be a balancing act, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people, especially if they fought for a while, they know where that sweet spot is. The problem, in my opinion, with a lot of combat sports is they just force people to be in those lower weight classes. Like, well, you can go smaller, you can go smaller, you can go smaller, you can go smaller. And who knows what kind of damage, what long-term damage we've done to our kidneys and stuff like that. Um, Just from trying to make, you know, what was it you said, some janky fight, you know? like. 
You know, there's people like, killing themselves in trash bags um, just to fight at, you know, Glasgow High School, you know? Yeah, yeah I got no, I got no, I got a, I got a, a cheap plastic trophy. Yeah, yeah, I got a whole, you know, storage unit full of trophies and ribbons that don't mean shit, you know what I mean? Yeah. It just is what it is. Yeah, the way I look at it now is, now I just, I just, I, I do the, what limited training I do now just mm-hmm. because of my, my current injuries. For sure. Injuries that I was sustained while in service mm-hmm. is just to protect myself and be as dangerous as I can Absolutely. now. Absolutely. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I focus on is I just need to be able to do what I can now and yeah. keep, keep, keep what I got. And that's what, that's more so what my jujitsu looks like now because, yeah. you know, jujitsu, there's so many different applications for so many different people and so many different body types. It's not going to look the same for everybody. Mm-mm. If you, you know, go onto YouTube right now and type in Brazilian jujitsu highlights, you're going to see some wild stuff like, you know, people spinning on their head and inverting and stuff yeah. like that. Cool. That's great. It's super cool for sport jujitsu. You know, try it at Minute Mart. Yeah. See what happens, you know? Like, that was, you know, up until when I tore my bicep, you know, I was teaching a takedown class every Wednesday morning at, at, at Donnie's at, at Hicks MMA. And, uh, you know, my thing was always, you know, these are Minute Mart approved techniques. Like, I'm not going to, you know, <laughs> like, you know, butt scooting's great, you know, sitting down, pulling guard, putting your, you know, putting your tools like in it. front of you. I might, yeah. I might steal that. Hey, please. steal it, man. I it's all yours. Place. I mean, I kind of, I kind of took it. down. I'm going to take it. <laughs> I kind of took it from gas station ready, you know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. but it has to be like, Let's say team but, but I, I looked at my jujitsu <laughs> game as a whole and I was like, man, there's too much stuff here. Like there's too much right. stuff. There's too much delineation from what the goal is, which the goal is control. The yes. goal is to get to a controlling position and in the fight, eliminate the threat one way or another where, right. you know, you know, submissions, chokes, pressure, you know, especially, yeah. you know, in security roles that I've had or, yeah. you know, when I was a bouncer, you know, it doesn't bode very well for me to rip somebody's shoulder out of socket like yeah. Dublin's on the well, and then night, in like you know? it, And in law enforcement, it, a lot of times, it, it, you know, it may be smart for me just to control and wait for backup. Mm-hmm. If I can just control and keep them from, yeah. from accessing my weapon yeah. or get into a position of advantage, you know, if I can, you know, I may not need to worry about an arm extraction. Yeah. If I can keep keep, mm-hmm. keep their arms under them and their arms are pinned, mm-hmm. okay, yeah. I got. I'll just wait here. Yeah. They're 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 controlled yeah. right now. So no, I, I agree with you. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like don't get me wrong, I love leg locks. I love the fifty fifty game of you know us being tangled up and looking like we're scissoring. I don't know if that's we can say that, but we're yeah, gonna say it. Um, like I love that game. I love the game. Like I understand it and I get it. Yeah. But I'm not gonna do that with some you know. Well, why you know, why risk yourself for injury? Yeah. Yeah. When, you know, again, I, I wrestled collegiately. I've done judo since 2007. Mm-hmm. I can take most people oh, yeah. down. I, I, and if I, I can't, then I can get to a good enough position when I land to sweep and get on top. I remember. And maintain that, to- and maintain that top <laughs> position, you know what I mean? I remember. I remember um, flying. So I removed yeah. everything that wasn't useful, you know? That's good. And as much as I enjoy, you know, hitting people with double legs and single legs, I took those out of my arsenal too because they took too much work. You know, I could chase a double leg for 30, 45 seconds and then – what I end up in guard, you know. So now we'll pass the guard and start the whole sequence over. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Now you know if I if I can, obviously some sometimes opportunities present themselves. But if I can, you know, all of my takedowns fed into my game, and all of my game feeds in and folds in on itself. So I guess you, with your judo background, you prefer like more of a more judo style takedown. Yes. Yeah. So one of well, you you know uh, Clark, don't you? Yeah. Yeah. So. So, Clark, Jonathan. Yeah, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah. So he he prefers more more jujitsu takedowns mm-hmm. just because yeah of, of his background. So you know I've I've learned both a, a lot from both of mm-hmm. you all. Um, so I, just, I was I'm, I was curious with that. So you know that kind of leads me into one of my questions I want to ask is, so for your average person, you know if they had to get into a martial arts, I know one of your answers is going to be Brazilian, Brazilian jiu jitsu right. because it's so applicable. Yeah. Uh, and, and, Obviously, in a reputable school mm-hmm. schoolhouse, but you know, at what would be a submission or a thing? What's the number one thing they need to learn? Uh, you know, to me, it would be escapes. Ex- yeah, I was going to say yeah. escapes. Yeah, just getting out of get, bottom. Get, I can't tell yeah. you how many guys that have come in protecting and, themselves and getting out. You know, and how many guys that have come in, big strong guys, um, you know, and they get taken down and they get to the bottom of mount and they freeze. And just stop. Or they what, get to the bottom of side control yeah. and they freeze. Well, you know, that that's that's impacts. 
You know, like that's what people don't understand. Or, you know, especially if (sighs) this happened a couple months ago, I took a guy down and uh, he also works in law enforcement. And when I got to the top of Mount, instead of trying to escape the Mount, he rolled to his belly to try to get, you know, to a turtle position. So, you know, I kicked his legs out from under him and like playfully started smacking him in the side of the head. And I was like, you can't do that. It's like you can't do that. This is a different, this is a different end game here. It's a, tra- it's a trading score. Yes. Not even that, but in the streets, if you're in turtle, your guns open. Yeah, you're for sure. Well, well, I mean, it, your guns open, but it, that that with the gun that gives you a whole nother level of. Oh, by the way, now you have to protect that. Yeah. You have to protect that. Like mm-hmm. so, you 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 can't do this now. Mm-hmm. You're having to. Yeah. Yeah. Apply pressure to that as well. Yeah. So you've lost a hand instantly. Mm -hmm. And for women, I I would still personally recommend just going straight to escapes and running away. Women don't need to be on the ground trying to Mm -hmm. fight, trying to wrestle, if that's the reason that they're going. The best fight, the best fight's the fight that you're not in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's the fight you avoid. Yeah. You know, if you can... Not getting a fight. That's we can. I don't know. The best fight's one you have backup for. Uh, yeah, that, yeah, that's that's the second best fight. Don't get in the fight if you got to fight. You if, if, you, if you get the fight, if you have to fight, do it well. But no, yeah, I, I if you got to fight, have friends that know how to fight. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, escapes would be my number one. Um, as far as if I were to refer somebody just starting out for a baseline level of self defense, as much as I love jujitsu and as much as I you know love wrestling, you know I feel like. You know, if you can find some place that offers like nogi judo, you know, or okay. kind of Greco Roman, like learning how to close that distance with people and how to manipulate their body, um, I think that that, you know, because a large portion, I think it's, I, I don't remember the percentages, but it's over ninety percent of all fights end up going to the ground. Yeah, and it's not so much what you know when you get there as opposed to how you got there, because a lot of times you'll see these you know goofy rednecks fighting and they just kind of fall. But if I control you to the ground and now I'm in a dominant position, it's okay if I know a little bit less because I'm going to elbow you in the forehead. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I if I can control you to the position to where I land on the top of side control and I, or I land on the top of mount, and especially if I have an arm or two secured, you know, now I'm dropping elbows, you're less worried about, you know, hip escaping and trying to get to a position where you can sweep from, you know. That's mm-hmm. where I'm at with it. That's good. So would that answer change if you said, so you got... Uh, a class full of females, Madison size. Would that would that answer change? No, no, no. I think distance okay, control good. and learning how to feel other people's body and use them against them is the most useful thing. Because yeah. if somebody grabs you and throws you to the ground, it doesn't matter for a long time anyway. It doesn't matter what you know when you get to the ground for a very long time. You're looking at five or six years before you're able to right. adequately defend yourself against somebody who weighs. You know, uh, when I first started training, they said it was basically, it was like 10 to 15 pounds per belt level. So if you had a 150 pound, you know, black belt, he would potentially have fits with a 200 pound blue belt who knew how to use his body weight effectively. Now that's obviously kind of changed because jujitsu has improved a lot. Right. But body weight matters for sure. For sure. No, no bones about it. It matters. Okay. Good. So, okay. Well, the reason I ask that question is if 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 you have a discipline and you say, well, if somebody's smaller, I would change my answer. No. Then that, to me, that's okay. Well, that's yeah. not really the right answer. Yeah, it's not going to look the same for everybody, but that's still the answer. Yeah. It may not. You Good. Know, <laughs> that's Sweet. my answer. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so going back to strongman mm-hmm. stuff a little bit. Uh, so you got your own gym, Grade Eight, Grade Eight Performance. Mm-hmm. So, tell us about that a little bit. Well, um, we are. Semi-private, you know, kind of close to the public. You kind of have to know me or somebody has to vouch for you to get in there. But we're not big, but we got about everything that you can imagine yeah. stuffed in there. You know, I've wanted a, um, <clears throat> I've wanted to own a gym for as long as I can remember, you know. And this kind of started with, you know, us just having a place. Um, so we started at Workout Anytime here in town. And then we kind of got pushed out by corporate. And we went to Total Fitness. And it didn't kind of work out. And then... You know, I went to another local gym who I'm not going to name, and it didn't really work out. So, you know, I that kind of segued into when COVID started and they were shutting everything down. So, you know, <clears throat> I put some money that I had put back into some equipment. So gym shut down on a Friday, and my garage was open for business on Monday. You know what yeah. I mean? Um, not business business, IRS, if you're listening. But, you know, 
my my clients never missed a workout. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so that continuity of training made a big difference where everybody else was sitting around getting stagnant or getting, you know, packing it on in the midsection. We were in there getting after it. Yeah. Um, Good workouts, they, too. I went to a yeah. couple of them. They were mm-hmm. awesome. Yep. I've still got your bottle somewhere. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, then it, it came to the point where on a Saturday, you know, I'd come out and there'd be 20 cars in my, in my you know, in my front yard. I was like, you know, I, I kind of got to find a place. Yeah. So the goal of the gym, you know, I, I keep a full-time job uh, on top of all the gym and training stuff. The goal of the gym is to only keep the lights on at the gym is for us to have a space. I don't, you know. Um, I, I go in pretty low expectations about, you know, making any sort of living there or anything like that, because honestly, I don't want it to stress me out. I don't mm. want it to take away from my enjoyment of it. You know what I mean? Right. So, <clears throat> yeah. So I talk more people out of joining than I actually let join. Right. That's, so you're running your gym kind of like I'm running, you know, my shooting business mm-hmm. a little bit. Like, I don't want to, I love teaching. I love, I, and I got to give you kudos to the teaching thing because, <laughs> because you're one of the original guys that was like why aren't you teaching mm-hmm. like why aren't you teaching people why are you, why aren't you teaching civilians like mm-hmm. you're teaching military you're teaching law enforcement why aren't you teaching civilians yeah and, and you know getting getting paid for your services because you do a good job at it and mm-hmm. i was like ah well you know because i would i would just go take friends to the range and mm-hmm. we'd just go have a good time and i'd be like right, what do we owe you ah. yeah see you later it's hard <laughs> it's hard putting a price on your abilities and putting a price on your training and everything that you've done yeah i get it yeah so but you know i have to thank you for giving me a little bit of motivation in Mm -hmm. that and and you know not making me do it but you know giving me the confidence of saying you know maybe i can do this Mm -hmm. and i have the ability to actually do this so you're you're definitely one of the guys that help help pave the way for uh american patriot defense to to get the uh get the ball rolling on that so uh, you're still paid up on a class, by the way. <laughs> so <laughs> if my schedule ever calms down, <laughs> it's a mess. It is a mess. So, uh, so, but, um, but yeah, so I, you know, the, the whole purpose of, you know, my, my thing is basically just one to help support my hobby. Cause mm-hmm. I shoot quite a bit and, mm-hmm. and to have the enjoyment and to help just keep building my resume yeah. to hopefully to do it full time. Cause I would like to do it full time. Yeah. That's what I, that is my overall goal is to, just be able to go out and be like, all right, hey, I got these three classes this week. Let's let's knock them out. Mm-hmm. So, so but that's what I'd like to do. Yeah. So oh, that's that's cool though. Sweet. Um, so, with your gym ownership, um, how many clients do you have right now? Um, so clients between online and in person um, is. 42 i believe that number is flexed as much as at the upper 60s um but you know with the economy tightening down and i didn't have a whole lot of exposure last year mm. um you know only competing one show and then you know getting injured so um <clears throat> obviously that's kind of decreased the numbers a little bit so it kind of ebbs and flows right. um but honestly i'm kind of enjoying the lower numbers to be honest because it gets nitpicky in the 60s uh oh, yeah. it feels like you're just a slave to your phone at times oh, i can um, see that yeah so, but yeah, my coaching, you know, I, I push out weekly workouts and it's all varied and, and you know, they, it all kind of, kind of follows a similar plan, but rarely will people do the same thing and you definitely won't be doing the same thing two weeks in a row and it kind of feeds, you know, what your goals are. When I first got started, I had a bunch of, you know, clients that were at my Marine Corps unit that just want to be more combat effective and I've still got a couple of those that are still, you know, in there from like 2019 that, you know, are still beasting their CFT and PFT every year just with my, you know, um, strength and conditioning programming and you know it's all kind of varied based on you know I've worked with jiu-jitsu athletes I've worked with I work with I'm working with three killers right now three kids oh, they wow. are incredible at jiu-jitsu. they are so good technically they're better than me it's ridiculous oh wow um yeah which isn't saying a whole lot but, you know they're, <laughs> no they're no they're very 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 good and they're very good kids um you know kids I've got you know pros uh you know from a lightweight women to heavyweight men you know, I just took three athletes to the Arnold this past weekend. I've got a guy that won Masters Nationals, which is 40-plus, uh, in the heavyweight division back in October. You know, I've got a guy, I have several that have, you know, podiumed at World's Strongest Man in our respective weight classes. You know, so, you know, I, I've worked with a whole myriad of athletes. I've got people that have done powerlifting competitions. You know, I've prepped people. I've got an ultra marathoner right now that I'm prepping as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's not just, you're not just no. prepping strongman. It's, no. it's, it's, it's a whole. Performance. Yeah. It's not so grade it's, eight. 
It's not grade eight powerlifting. See, it's and not, that's something I'm learning right now. Yeah. I didn't know it was just. I thought you were just focusing on the powerlifting. Yeah. If we can periodize it, I can program it. That is the only time that I defer out. Um, and I've <clears throat> I make frequent Facebook posts about this. Is um, you know I, I stay in my own lane as far as that goes. So you know strength conditioning, I understand. I understand what combat yeah. conditioning needs to look like, both in MMA and you know. Uh, if you're doing some sort of workup for deployment, stuff like that. I know what the conditioning needs to look like. Right. But I'm not going to program somebody for an Olympic weightlifting meet. Go to Powerhouse. They have a whole group of Olympic weightlifters. Go. That's fine. I'm not a bodybuilder. Do I know how to build muscle? Yeah, absolutely. But do I know how to, you know, taper everything and draw you up nice and tight so you can get on stage in a bikini? No. Go to Fuel. There's plenty of pie for everybody in town. But if performance is your goal and you want to be the strongest athlete that you can, then we might be the place for you, you know? Right. But if you want to be the big fish in a little pond, we're not your guy. If you want to be the strongest guy at BAC, we're not your place, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's just kind of getting in where you fit in. Right. So, you know, I program people with what they're comfortable with, you know? And while I've never been an ultra marathoner, I, you remember when I was an avid runner. Yeah. I know what it needs to look miles. like. Miles. Miles, like 40, 50 miles a week. Because I had yep. to to stay so small, yep. you know, to fight MMA. So, you know, I know what it can look like. And there are frequent times that, you know, I, I refer people out if, you know, um, you know, again, so people have come to me before wanting me to prep them for a bodybuilding meet I don't, or a bodybuilding competition. Right. And I refer them out. Hey, go here. Hey, go do this. Hey, go, you know, I have no quarries about doing that. So. All right. That's awesome. Like, like, well, I'm like, I'm just learning something <laughs> about that. That's pretty cool. That's, that's awesome. So you mentioned injuries. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you're recovering from an injury by a, a, a bicep. Uh, I did. Right um, I've been pretty fortunate. Like I said, um, done the sport for about 10 years now. Only had one real substantial injury and that was a, a left bicep detachment. Um, tore that back in mid August. Mm, yep. Um, had surgery around the first week of September and, uh, you know, kind of flew through recovery. I felt like, I feel you like know? you yeah, was yeah. quick before the end. Of, like I had surgery September 1st, I think, um, I, maybe, maybe August, uh, 31st. Um, but by the end of September, I was already back to a 400 pound bench press. Um, you know, which isn't all bicep dependent, but it's dependent on the brakes and I could straighten my arm again. So that was, you know, pretty big in my um, my ortho was kind of worried about that. Do you, uh, do you want to know what recovery methods you use? Did you use anything crazy? Well, crazy, like ice bath, that kind of stuff. Any special vitamins? Yeah. I mean, we can get into that. Yeah. Um, so I'm on testosterone replacement therapy. So mm-hmm. TRT, yeah. big fan of that. Um, Me too. Get yeah. your levels checked. Uh, you know, if you're uh, above this age, you know, I'm 34. Um, on, on top of that, I ran a pair of peptides, one of which was BPC-157, and the other one is TB-500, both legal. You can order them on the internet. Um, but, uh, you know, I would, you know, I would pin those peptides directly in the bicep every day. I was oh, taking, wow. you know, 400 micrograms of each per day, um, because I was motivated. So, I actually tore my bicep doing a qualification video for World's Strongest Man in my weight class. So, I submitted the video anyway and got an invitation <laughs> and it was the so, first week of december so savage <laughs> yeah well it was the first it was the first week of december um and again i had i had surgery on september the first so you know you know i was like you know we're gonna send it we're gonna ride it to the wheels fall off and you know the closer i got you know there were some personal things that had kind of snuck up and kind of limited my ability to uh, really train the way I wanted to, and I wanted to be able to put my best foot forward right. um, on that stage. So I ended up being unable to compete uh, at that show. I still went down there because I had a few athletes competing uh, down there in their respective weight classes. Um, but, uh, yeah, so that that pretty well sums up my recovery protocol as far as that goes. Um, but, yeah, it took me probably – probably 12 weeks before I trusted it 16 weeks out I hit a um national record on an 18 inch deadlift yeah um I pulled a thousand and five pounds from my knees uh which is a contested lift in strongman which is an 18 inch deadlift um so you know set that national record I use quotes because it's you know it's just I hold a couple national records it just is what it is right um but that was when I finally felt like I was good to go 
you know, that I could finally trust it with whatever I needed to. And that was my first show back, so it was nice to come back and get a win um, before I figured out what was next. So. Gotcha. So what is, uh, what's your favorite lift, though, to do? What's oh, your favorite? log, for sure. Yeah, yeah, log clean and press. That's I, my jam. I, I, I see you do that. Yeah, that's my jam. I really like stones, too. Um, there's just something about picking up a big rock and putting it over a, you know, Makes sense a bar. Yeah. <laughs> big rock. Uh, uh, uh. Big, big rock. Um, heavy thing. So up. yeah. So yeah, <laughs> I really awesome. like heavy stones. Um, and I really like, you know, any kind of press, but logs specifically. What's the, what's, what do you think the most challenging one is to do? Like you're Ooh. probably, well, when I say challenging, I don't know if challenging would be the right word. Maybe the... Yeah, challenging. What's, what's, the your, hardest, what's the, your most challenging? The hardest list? for me is any, you know, any moving event. You know, I try not to, I'm never going to be that guy that, like, lets my height, you know, limit me in things. Um, but most of the guys that I compete against are 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, so when we're having a moving event, you know, it's 50 uh, foot for time. The other gate is just... Yeah, the weight's not heavy enough that it's going to come out of my grip. You know, a farmer's per hand for us in competition might be 325 pounds a hand. That's not heavy. That's not heavier than my grip has the ability to hold, but I can only move so fast. I got these little legs, you know what I mean? So (laughs) any of those moving events, you know, it's, it definitely favors me the heavier something gets. So a yoke, for instance, that we carry on our back, Right. you know, I carry a 600 pound yoke about the same speed as I carry a 900 pound yoke. So if they put it 900 or plus, we're going to be all right. You know, if they put it in that, 700 to 750 range those guys are going to be so fast. fast yeah and especially if there's a turn and you know uh because your gate your gates your gate. yeah it just depends on you know it depends on what the distance is it depends on a lot of things you know so that's probably been like my biggest you know there for a while i was real in my head about these you know baby burger king hands i was like you know my grip blah 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 because you know every competition we talked earlier about you know the cardio aspect of strongman but you may do five shows without there being a max lift in anything. Mm-hmm. Most shows you're going to have a press, long mm-hmm. axle, um, you know, circus dumbbell, barbell, something like that. Most shows you're going to have a deadlift variation. You know, might be on an axle, might be you know, a deadlift bar, might be a car, might be any number of things. But then you're going to have two moving events. One might be you know a sandbag carry or a farmer's walk or a yoke or a combination of them. Um, and then typically there's a load, so there's a keg or a, a throw maybe or a or an atlas stone load. So there's only two or three things where you're standing still typically. Right. So you you have to be able to move as well. So speaking speaking of throws, mm-hmm. there's a there happens to be a video, <laughs> and Madison's not up here, but we'll we'll make sure we'll dub this video in uh, that way our viewers can watch this amazing <clears throat> video. There happens to be some some throws mm-hmm. that are on the the interwebs. Um, where uh, where you may have, what what happened? Like did you just lose so, footing? Lose maximum grip? effort. That's what happened. Maximum so effort. so uh, it was Clash of the Rockies, uh, which I was trying to get my qualification to go back and compete at the ESPN show. Um, and they had a uh, they had an event where it was a single arm sandbag over bar uh, for a max weight. It was over fifteen feet. So we started at like thirty five pounds. Um, and I had thrown, I'd hit a 55 pound over 15 feet leading up to training. So I knew that I was good, you know, up into the 50s. Um, but if memory serves, I hit the 50 and then I moved to the 52 and a half because I started doing two and a half pound jumps after that. And uh, I can't remember if I missed the first one and then on the second one, but it was just, man, it was just maximum effort, man. I just dug in, and when I flung it, it just flung me. And I, it was, you know, it was comical. My little arms are flapping in the wind. But I, And it was live stream, too, so I landed, and I just thought, you idiot. Like, you, they're going to have so much fun with this. Well, and, we'll make sure. And we'll, boy, did they. We'll put it on picture we'll put it on picture. On picture. We'll put it right we'll, here. Yeah. We'll, Boy, it, did they! It will, it will yeah. Be, be. But but since you know, since sandbags have been a lot more prevalent, they're a really easy event to put in shows. We'll we'll, we'll make sure all fifty two of our viewers see it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so it's a it's a pretty comical video, but it it's a maximum effort. That's that's what happened. We may even title this. this <laughs> we're gonna title this podcast "Maximum Effort." I like it. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. Uh, Let's get into some uh, some more training talk a little bit, okay. if you don't if you don't care. Um, 
so we talk we obviously we train some mixed martial arts mm-hmm. and stuff growing up you know and I, I know you're you're a gun guy mm-hmm. as well as you know you, unfortunately you're a collection of cough guy uh, <laughs> you've been trying to transfer me it's not going to happen and, and we respect that uh. <laughs> so listen so let me let me go ahead and address that I'm an AK guy in principle. If, if the balloon were to go up tomorrow, you and I both know my AR is going to come with me. Like it would be hard for me to leave, you know, my AK in the safe. But it doesn't make sense. Do I appreciate the operating system and how functional it is? Absolutely. But it's not the same. It's not the same thing. So, so where where did your uh, where do you think that your um, your training be- began? Was it the Marine Corps or before for sure. that? Oh, for sure. Like, I'd shot here and there, but I didn't really understand shooting until the Marine Corps. Like, I didn't understand what it took to be accurate. I didn't really understand breathing control or anything right. like that. Um, it was just, like, me getting together with some buddies and us trying to shoot Glocks, you know? Like, it wasn't it wasn't anything good. Yeah, you like, like that? Like like Chris. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. You remember that time we came out yeah, here? Yeah, like you robbed a liquor store. <laughs> I do. I remember it well. Good Chris little hobbit <clears> album. <laughs> but, um, you know, so it was all, like... You know, we would just go out and mag dump. Like, I didn't understand, you know, finding my post and, like, getting in a good position, especially with a handgun. Yeah. Um, So, the Marine Corps really taught me how to shoot. Okay. Um, And then it taught me to enjoy it, you know. That was about, you know, I don't have a whole lot of good things to say about, you know, my time in the Marine Corps, especially in the reserves, the component that I was with. Um, But one thing that I did really enjoy was I got to shoot a lot. Like, almost every time we had drill, I got to shoot something. Yeah. You know, and, you know, RATs when we go to Jamaica or, I bet I shot 10,000 rounds that week or over the course of a few weeks while we were in Jamaica, I shot and shot and shot. That's awesome. Yeah, it was great. And, you know, we're pushing squad movements um, on this live fire range. And, you know, of course I was a squad leader then, so I'm, you know, and again, just a training iteration, but, you know, it felt really good to like, hey, we've built this foundation for all these years for me to actually get to do it without the training wheels on a little bit. Right. You know what I mean? You know, so we'd have this target at the end and we'd have to push berm to berm. You know, that was the first time right. that we'd ever done anything like that. And that's one thing I have to say that in, in general that I've noticed, and, you know, of course I, I'm out now and I can, I'll can i say whatever I want to say. Uh, but I think the Marines do better for the most part mm-hmm. than the Army is the, I feel like the average Marine gets throughout their year yeah. gets more trigger time than the average army soldier does. Yeah. Uh, just in general. We shot a lot. Yeah. Uh, now that, that's not saying that your <clears throat> specific army units, depending on whatever their job For is, sure. they get their own trigger time. Yeah. I was fortunate enough to get a lot of trigger time in the units that I was in and what, what I did, you know, and you know, cause I was in a lot of instructor roles <clears throat> and teaching roles too. So I got really fortunate with that. Right. But I was, a lot different than a lot of other guys. Yeah. So, um, you know, I feel like the Marines, every, every, pretty much every Marine that I talked to that was in a, um, you know, either infantry, MP, um, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of role, combat arms, yeah. combat service support, uh, role, always talked about, even in the reserves, yeah. always talked about getting trigger time multiple times a year. Well, that kind of changed. We had a very, very good CO. I hope he doesn't end up watching this because I don't want him to think that I'm, you know, uh, nut riding or whatever, but he ended up being a pretty good guy. And we talk, you know, pretty frequently. He's a light colonel now. Um, but he understood the utility. Like, he understood, you know, for years and years and years, we had COs who were like, oh, you got to prepare for blah, 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 blah. But they would keep the training wheels on, you know, and we would do, like, you know, a level one shoot every single time, like, a static range. I'm like, right. bro, what is this What is this preparing us for? Yeah. Like, at least take us out and haze us in the sand pit. Before, before we go do out it, and get back online. Add, add so, some stress to it. Something. Yeah. Anything. Like, yeah. I don't care what my numbers are anymore. I've shot double expert for as long as they've had the test, you know. So that was my, that was the hardest part for me to buy into is because they had this regimented, you know, 12-month training block. And, you know, by the end of the 12 months, there's no, there's nobody that's staying in. So you've got to restart it. Yeah. So there was no, like, advance, there were no school seats available for us to go to SRT or non-lethal or anything like that because I volunteered every time they came available. I wanted to do something. Um, you know, so I was three or four years in and I was doing the exact same shit as when I first joined until we went to Jamaica. Until we went, to, I mean, honestly, Jordan, we didn't really get to do a lot of cool stuff either. Jamaica was like the pinnacle, you know, because, <clears throat> and that was, that was, I think, kind of when they saw of what it could be. 
you know, and don't get me wrong, like safety is super important, and I'm not going to take away from that. But we had to split range, and there's like, you know, 50 yards between targets A and targets B. There's like 10 targets on each. There's like 50 yards between them. So one iteration, or like, so we were working with um, Princess something Canadian Light Infantry. Uh, I keep wanting to say Princess Peach, but it's not that. (laughs) But anyway, they were super locked on, you know, operators out of Canada. And uh, one of our, I think it was a gunny, like, uh, like Target A, we'll say, was down here shooting, and Target B was changing their targets out. And some gunny comes out and calls a ceasefire and freaks out in Jamaica. He's like, what are y'all doing being down range? And the Canadians were like, what are you talking about? Like, there's there's 50 yards between us, and we're not facing each other. Like, like this is going to take forever. Yeah, you're going to have to, like, perp- you need a, yeah. like, your Marines going to have to purposely yeah. be aiming at it. Yeah, yeah. So finally. the common, It's got to pass the common sense factor. Right. And But you had to look at, like, it was, like, Marine Corps Reserves and, like, uh, the Canadian Special Forces, the Mexican Marines, and it was like the same platoon that had like taken down El Chapo. Like they were some badass operators. Like they were they were superhuman. I don't even know what they were. <laughs> they would stay up all night drinking tequila and partying, and they would sleep for like two hours, and they'd be out running in the morning. Like they were nuts. Yeah, they're built different. They're built different for sure. <laughs> um, and then they'd get done training and they'd play soccer all evening until they started drinking tequila. It was wild. <laughs> but you know, so it was like a couple of other like operator groups and then us you know and i'm not to like you know shit on our experience because we had some you know some decent trigger pullers especially people with multiple combat deployments we had a couple members on the marine corps shooting team um but i was that was the first time that i saw i was like oh that's how people like like safety is important but it reminded me of the scene in black hawk down where they're trying to get on eric banya for not having his safety on he's like this is yeah. this is my safety like yeah. we're the we're the warrior we're the warfighters here won't you let us handle it kind yeah. of deal like yeah. that that was kind of the impasse that they came to and it was some like e4 in the canadian special forces it was like Fuck off. you know he just <laughs> said in his like he was like get out of here gunny like no one cares like, it'll be french probably yeah like, he's probably like yeah. french he's like you're not important here he's like go on gunny and uh, so he, you know, got all gruffed up, and then and then that was it. So, yeah. uh, but that was like, once they finally shut up and just let the Canadians run our training, I was like, yes, you know, yeah. we're running shoot houses, and they're moving the walls around, and you know, we're doing cool. direct yeah. a threat. You know, I did do, you know, for all my misgivings with the Marine Corps Reserve and how they mismanaged them. You know, we did we did some cool stuff. We did a lot of active shooter stuff. Right. You know, running direct a threat and stuff like that, especially at the schoolhouse. Um. But they just lacked the follow through, and they lacked the uh, retention rates to be able to really make anything out of it. You know, yeah. you know, everybody retires to the National Guard after they get out of the Marine Corps. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. I was I was wondering when you were going to drop your packet in. Eventually. I kept waiting for. Well, it. Well, uh, what you know, I've sent this to you a couple times. But what's that uh, recruiting poster? It's like sometimes the best soldier for the job is a Marine. <laughs> why? Why? How in the world? How know. in the world the Army put that out one day? We'll never. I'll never understand. It I wasn't that long, but it was long enough for me to get. Well, most of the time, it's marine. It's all the marines come out. Of it. Wait a second, I can get twenty thousand dollars for doing yeah. my exact same job. Yeah, and pick up E six in three months. <laughs> Sign me up. Okay, yeah, I'll do that. Sure. Yeah. Uh, what's another? What's another four years? Yeah. <laughs> I was already doing it last yeah. month. <laughs> so they do a really good job, like making you really question the buy in. Like, yeah. you know, it, it again. It'd have been different if something was like on the horizon, or we had deployments coming down. You know, when mm-hmm. I first joined. You know, they'd put out, and they're like, hey, you know, we, we need 10 people to go to Iraq. And I'm like, boom, sign me up. This is before I had kids. And then they were like, hey, we need a whole platoon to go to Afghanistan. I was like, sign me up. You know, and then, you know, we got pregnant, and they're like, hey, we need five people to go to Afghanistan. I'm like, nah, I'm good. But then they they made a, they threw a big fit about it because nobody wanted to go, and then they didn't send anybody anyway. Yeah. They didn't send anybody. So so, so what, what I'm hearing is what's the, the whole the whole raw factor and the I'm a Marine factor come Oh, kind of gets washed the, out, and then it's like, okay, well, you know, yeah. army's not so bad. Army's not so bad. Army's not. We so can bad. all we can both agree, Air Force and Coast Guard probably would have been a way better option. Oh, for sure, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Air Force definitely would have been yeah. the gig. I, I, I've got a, I got a, uh, I had a. Well, I taught a CCDW class mm-hmm. this past weekend. They, uh, one of the students, their son is a Coast Guard. I didn't, I didn't really get in detail what he, yeah. what he was doing. I, I don't know what his job was. But they told me where his base was. It's a, it was a coastal base. And I was mm-hmm. like, oh, God. 
they're like, and they're like, <coughs> they're like, what? And I was like, I was just. Uh, just a reminder that I made poor decisions. Yeah, <laughs> there, so, I was like, I can't think of a, I can't think of on top of my mind any Coast Guard base that is, like bad. There, yeah, I was like Alaska. Well, no, even then, like maybe a couple of months out of the year, it would be bad. But you'd get used to it. Well, let me tell you, the closest <laughs> I came to joining the Army, and this is a real deal. So, <clears throat> are you familiar with the Army Warrior Fitness Team? Yeah. So, did you know the Army Warrior Fitness Team, who basically does CrossFit, also has a strongman component? I did not. They do. And it was founded by my buddy Anthony Furman, who runs Clash. So they gave Anthony Furman an open warehouse at Fort Knox and an empty checkbook and moved him, and he was under recruiting, so it was his responsibility to hold tryouts and, you know, do all this stuff. So I did several workouts up there at the Army Warrior Fitness Training Facility. And, you know, eventually he was like, hey, man, oh, what's it going to... Young was about yeah. to roll up there. Oh, listen... <laughs> And I'll tell you, and you'll understand exactly why I didn't. So he calls me one day. He's like, hey, man, uh, I got a real question for you. I was like, what's up? He was like, what's it going to take for you to join the Army? He said, I've got a spot for you on the Army Warrior Fitness Team. I said, okay. I said, "Uh, do I have to sign a four-year contract? He said, yes. I said, do I have to sign active duty? He said, yes. I said, what has to be my MOS? He goes, oh, you'll have to be 11 Bravo. I was like, so let me make sure I understand this correctly. So I sign up to go in the Army. And I go, where do they do? Benning, mm-hmm. wherever 11 Bravos go. So You wouldn't have to do that, though. I would for, I'd have to go to school infantry. Uh, your combat, your combat training doesn't count for that? No. No. Hmm. So I go to school infantry. What happens if I go there and, you know, I'm almost 30 at this point. What happens if I go there and break an ankle or blow a knee out? Yeah. You know, but now, but listen, that's not even what, what really changed it. I was like, you know... How long do you know that the Army Warrior Fitness Team is going to be a thing? He's like, oh, we don't have any idea. I was like, no, Army's too short-minded for that. I was like, I can't do that. Well, yeah, well, they're they're you, back to the normal PT test now. You know, the you, one, know you know how many how many strong men are members of the Army Warrior Fitness Team now? Zero. <laughs> yeah, zero. Well, there might be one guy up there, but they don't have a team. That's just a guy that trains strong men out of the CrossFit gym. Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong; those guys had a sweet gig. Their only job was going to work out and then going, the Army would fly them all over to strongman competitions yeah. and stuff that they were sponsoring. Then one Sergeant Major's, one Sergeant Major and one General's idea to be like, hey, why are they doing that? Now exactly. Put, put them. And now I'm stuck in an active duty 11 Bravo contract with a kid. Yeah. And then. No thanks. Yeah. And then, and Knox doesn't have any <coughs> infantry slots, so they'd be like, mm, where, yeah. does he need, where does he need to go? Yeah. Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> well, been okay. Um, so yeah, that's what ended up swaying that. Um, okay. But it was a good. It would have been a cool opportunity. That would um, that would have been pretty cool. For the year or so that it would have lasted, it would have been great. That would have been pretty cool. But I think it's twenty twenty four. I would have only gotten out like last year. <laughs> yeah, this was like 2018, 2019 when he came to me with this. Oh well, that's uh, everything that happens for a reason. Yeah. Yeah. Everything happens for a reason. (laughs) 